started. All right, folks, um, welcome uh, to our session today of the OKD Working Group meeting. And we are about one minute before the hour, so we'll wait a couple of minutes. And I'll stop sharing for now. Say hi to everybody. Hi, Fabian. Hey, hey. Hey there. And Fabian, you were hello, here. Hello, hello. You're here to talk about one of the um, subtopics. Is that right? Is that are you on the agenda? Let's see if I have you muted. I might have you muted. Oh, you're self muted. Whoops. Sorry, I have my headphone mute too. Got confused. Um, yeah, uh, Tim Apple and I were were going to talk about the uh, OKD Ansible collection uh, that we introduced uh, last quarter. All right. So, um, and can you do that in under ten minutes? Um, well, Tim had the main presentation that he was going to give, um, and I think it's probably pretty quick. Um, we also have a demo, but I've got a repo with a demo in it with instructions to run it as well. So if we don't have time to run through that, we can just paste the link and anybody interested can uh, take a peek there. So I think that should be doable. Okay, because we have a, a lot on our agenda today. Um, so my Vadim is here, good, um, I'm there. And in the link is the, um, the attendance thing, so if you can do that. What we're gonna try and do today is, because um, I know we set you up to, to do a, a talk on this, because I like to have people give this, is we're gonna try and give updates on, from different projects here that intersect with OKD. But we're also gonna try and do a triage today of the open um, issues list. So um, that if you can do this, um, Timothy's here, I can see Timothy. Um, we'll get started right on time. And what I might try and do is get you guys to do your stuff up front in the first um, 10 minutes or so. Um, and then, so we can use because I just wanted to introduce you and your topic to the, the group. Um, and then you can give everybody the resource links and then we'll move into the triage. Um, Vadim, does that sound reasonable to you today? Um, yeah, I or think triage should be. We could, we could skip the triage, yeah. Um, there are quite a few tickets that just need verification. And uh, it's just not worth wasting time on it today. Okay, so, um, okay, well that changed my plan for the day. Um, so cool, let me just swap back out here for a minute. And start scaring the screen. So, um, all right, well let's get started then. So one of the things, <coughs> my, my top of my list today was to do the open um, OKD issues triage list because I wanted to see if we could min minimize the 77, and I saw this morning when I woke up, it was down to 73. So um, that's that's a good good thing. Um, and I wanted to thank uh, John Horton for um, stepping up and helping out um, this past couple of weeks and, and making that happen. Vadim, you want to give a quick update on um, what uh, what's gone on with closing some of them and what the status of the release is, and then we'll go into the Ansible um, collections talk quickly. Sure. Um, so this Saturday we're going to release a new stable version. I don't think it has any major fixes yet because we realized that vSphere installs are broken because of weird behavior of Network Manager. Mm -hmm. We have a fix in the pipeline and hopefully it would be merged uh, this week. Um, another significant problem is mirroring images. That depends on how fast our CI gets updated to the new image and we'll have this rebuild. So uh, not much depends on us here. Uh, there has been two CVs fixed in Fedora kernel. One of them related to sudo. Wait, two CVs, one of them sudo, one of them kernel. The Dora folks are releasing a new stable today. We will be updated to it automatically, and hopefully by the end of the week, uh, it would be in the stable build. Um, I think that's all the critical parts for now. Okay. So that's 
that's awesome news. So I did notice a lot of people stepped up and um, did some closing and commenting on the issues. So thank you all for that. Um, were there any outstanding questions? If we can do this part of the day quickly, then we'll get it done um, from the, any of the issues that people had um, posted. Hi, everybody. So I think uh, Joseph just uh, pointed to one issue that is still standing. Um, and that is the uh, the copy mirroring uh, issue where uh, the MIME type is wrong. So that's been fixed in the library, and now we just have to get that uh, into into the builds uh, into our image builder. Uh, so yeah, I'm not sure if there's a PR open for that already, but um, that is going to trickle down eventually. Um, yeah, we're just not there yet. Okay. Awesome. All right. Um, well, then I'm going to stop sharing for a minute. Uh, question Is it, do you think that um, even if we get uh, a 4.7 released before this mirror problem is uh, fixed in 4.6, that we can uh, uh, push uh, 4.6 in between for the guys uh, that are still uh, caught on 4.5? Yeah, it doesn't matter which version it lands because our CI upgrade, our CI build farms need to be need to have this fix, and our CI build farms are on 4.7. Um, the only question now is to make sure that we cherry pick that fix to all the versions we release, so that you wouldn't hit it when you build your own image. For mirroring, all we care about is the images produced by our CI, and the only thing which matters is the version running on that CI. Okay, so you think uh, that we could um, get a 4.6 that uh, maybe has uh, this mirror problem fixed, so we can uh, proceed with 4.7, right, and not have to jump over the 4.6 release. Okay, thank you. Right on. Sounds good. In in the chat, um, do we have a 4.7 to start asking people to do a public push on? I think we have nightlies, and eventually we will be we will release those nightlies as stable. Uh, we're pretty far from that, like at least a couple of weeks far. Right, but guessing. it would be really great if we did this during OCP um, release candidate testing, so that fixes from OKD and the issues we hit would be prioritized and would be counted as if they were hit on OCP. We were trying to do the whole thing like last couple of releases, but maybe this time it would actually be happening. So, um... yeah, I've been building on 4.7 and playing with it with some of our testing with Vadim. Um, looks okay overall. I think there's a couple of things, but I'm not sure whether we should be posting bug reports yet for 4.7 on OKD, or is that no, it's certainly, at this point? It's certainly worth it because um, we would still have to land the fix for them in 4.7 and then she would pick to 4.6 anyway. Yeah, I'm seeing some weirdness with the installer, so I don't know if that's a particular to 4.7 or a particular to... Um, All right, I'll... If, if Jamie is offering to um, do a little, um, perhaps a recipe, or a write-up um, on deploying um, how to test with the nightlies for 4.7, I can do some um, outreach for us, um, maybe create a postcard and a link and, and do some socializing um, of that. We want to get that test in, and then we can figure out, um, you know, how how you want them to, to to add the issues, and if we tag them as four seven issues, or um, that would be, we'll get that updated. And so, if you give me a release link and and that, Jamie, then I can send it out on mailing lists and other places. Let's see if we can get that going. Joseph's asking, what are the most important fancy features in OCP four seven? Um, yeah, Vadim, that's kind that's of what, what I think. I think this was a stably 
stably release. Yeah, I cannot think on top of my head what's super great. Oh, maybe Ubeard as an install platform. But it probably depends on Ironic, meaning we don't have it in Ugiri. Uh This needs testing, and we'll contact the docs team to have what's new prepared so that we could evangelize it. Yeah, and there's some... Um, there was a 4.7, I think, public-facing um, debrief as well. So um, I'll, I'll see if I can find the link to that and post that in the mailing uh, on the, the Google group. So, wasn't, that, wasn't that last week? I think they had a big presentation yeah. of the what's new in 4.7. Yeah. Lots of networking stuff I saw was, was one of the biggest things. Yeah. I'll find that. I, I just uh, pasted a link to the, to the slide deck uh, of that presentation. Yeah. That's pretty good. Uh, that is obviously OCP 4.7, but the same is uh, obviously true for OKD. Yeah. Lots. Lots of stuff, but I, I, it sort of felt more like a stabilization release to me um, than, than anything else. And there's the YouTube video, so you can watch it and follow along with the slides. Um, oh, cool. All right. Is so, OpenShift Builds V2? Um, that is essentially, we have this build API in OpenShift, um, and the Build V2 uh, project uh, is called Shipwrite, the upstream project. I'll uh, paste it in a second. And it's essentially based on top of Tekton tasks. Um, so yeah, it's, mm. it's the successor to the Build V1 API. Oh, so does this replace build configs and stuff? Yeah, I think uh, eventually that is the plan. Okay. Coming to a theater near you. Mm. And yeah, um, the other thing that um, Jamie mentioned was taking all the 3.11 um, mentions off of the OKD site and in the there, um, I think it's time. So, um, though I keep seeing 3.11 questions on OKD in the OpenShift-Dev um, chat room, so there are people out there still using it. So. Yeah, we I'm still, still using it. I, I heard 3.11 in production. Yeah, it's still supported, I and, it, it's still, a bit. and it's still quite a bit easier to deploy a smaller cluster with. Um, I would still, still support it until I still we still support it until July anyway. Okay, so maybe I have some time before I take it off the site. Okay. Yeah, I'm not saying that that's a good thing. I'm saying that you know this is this is a gap we still haven't closed with OKD four. Yeah, we're working on it, Fabian. Slowly but surely, <laughs> we can say it's going away. Yes, Jamie, I think we have to figure out some verbiage for that as well. Oh, get moving. Four dot X. When we get that self-contained single node cluster build fully up and running, that that will make it easier for the home lab people that don't have a full stack of compute power. Yeah. Like me. <laughs> yes, yes, Neil, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> I have that, one that, lowly NUC device, and it cost me a, quite a lot of money to have, and it's it's all I have. All right. So, um, so yeah, I, I think the the single cluster, uh, single node cluster setup is uh, slated to come in 4.8. It will not support upgrades um, in, in 4.8, uh, at least. Uh, that'll certainly come later. Um, one thing I wanted to say uh, with regards to docs, um, I'd like to really implore uh, each and every one of you to um, participate yourself in, in uh, the improvement of those docs. It's all open source. It's in the OpenShift docs repository. If you see something like we, we still uh, refer to 3.x or, you know, that there's RCOS mentioned in, in, on that page, it should be FCOS for OKD. Please feel free uh, and go ahead and open a PR yours. That that just makes it so much easier for um, for all of us here at Red Hat because obviously it's the same amount of time we we'd have to spend on that. Um, and we yeah, it, it's not a high priority. So obviously, if if you ask us to do that, uh, we're, we're probably not going to do it right away. Um, that might cause frustration and. 
you can work around that by uh, doing it yourself. So that, yeah, that's really just all I wanted to say. Um, we we do appreciate all the help with the documentation a lot, and it, it really helps us a lot. And um, I think if you as a community um, dive into that as well, um, it's going to be even better. Yeah. <laughs> please, please, please contribute to our documentation. So the the other the other side of the coin too is um, our onboarding and contribute you know how to contribute in uh, the contribute contribution ladder um, content on the site is pretty weak as well. And Amy um, Merrick, who's on the call, and I sat last week and did sort of a quick audit and run through of, of what what um, what was missing um, to make it really easy for people to get started and do some low hanging fruit stuff. So um, I am going to say that. Maybe every other Tuesday when we're not meeting here this hour, um, I'm going to sort of dedicate to working on um, the contribution um, and the onboarding stuff in this in the site. So if other people want to join, um, let me know, and um, I'll just invite you to this blue jeans, and we can just hack and, and work our way through that because um, that is Vadim. You've done some amazing stuff, getting you know helping people get stuff there, but there are some very basic stuff that's um, missing. Um, and if you go to, uh, there's a wonderful site that I've been reviewing that that I'm, um, I have a fantasy that ours will be as good as it. It's called Porter.sh. Um, it's one of the new CNCF projects, and they have um, great documentation there. So I'm going to try and mimic some of that stuff, um, and with a little coaching help from Amy, who's on the call here. So thanks again, Amy. And um, so anyone who wants to do that kind of work with me, um, let me know. Raise up your hand and. Um, I'll invite you to a Tuesday meeting next week, um, and we can look at it and see if it's done. So, um, yeah, because getting started is an, is starts off a, a little bit higher level than um, most people who are brand new um, can get get started right. with. Thanks for jumping in. Uh, hi everyone, it's the first time that I joined this meeting. Uh, I'm Sandro Bonazzola from Red Hat Virtualization and Dover Team. Nice to meet you all. Hello, Sandro. Hi, Neil. So um, I joined the meeting after uh, testing OKD in the past months. And I, I come from the OVIR community, which is kind of a different community than the OKD one. Uh, and the first thing that I saw trying to get into OKD is that it's kind of difficult for a user to, to get user content from from the web. If you have any trouble and you try to search for a solution on the web, you don't find anything. So yeah. uh, I would suggest to, to start thinking about how to make uh, the discussion happening uh, on CoreOS, uh, oh sorry, on, on the Slack uh, channel or on, um, on the Google uh, group, uh, somehow indexed and uh, uh, searchable so people can find what they are looking for uh, without having to understand first where to search. Uh, it, it will make it easier for a first timer uh, getting the basic stuff for getting started. Cool. Yeah, one of the pitfalls of you know the Kubernetes community as a whole choosing to use Slack for both community support as well as development is all that knowledge is locked up and not available for the broader uh for the for for everyone else to you know take a dive in and to learn from and that's that's really unfortunate and that's one of the reasons i've been i'm kind of unhappy that we use slack for all this stuff uh because it's it's so closed and it's not it's not fair to everyone else who wants to be able to learn from this stuff. So we have some work cut out for us, and Sandro, um, if you want to join in and on, t on the, every other Tuesday, um, I'd love to, to figure out what we can do to, to make that better. Um, and we do have space on the um, GitHub repo for OKD.io also to host some of this if we need to, so um, we can do that, make that happen. So, yeah. So I want to stop for a minute, if that's okay with everybody, and hand it over to the Ansible Collections folks who came today to, to chat with us about what the work that they're doing. So Fabian and Tim, um, if you want to 
introduce yourselves and your topic, and um, so that's okay. And keep chattering in the um, chat while they're doing that. There we go. Yeah. Thanks for coming. Thanks. Um, did, did my slides show up? Yes, indeed, they are. We see you. Okay. Yeah, we see them. I'm, I'm on too many video conference systems. I, I lose track to how each of them work. Uh, I know your pain. Yes. I'm, I'm up to six of them now. Yeah, that's why I think I'm at too. So I'm always losing buttons and features for that reason. Because I'm like, wait, oh, that's on Zoom, not on Google. Oh, that's blue jeans. Yeah. Anyway, sorry. So um, I want to start here. I'll let uh, Fabian introduce himself for, uh, then. Uh, so I'm Tim Outen. I'm a senior product manager on the Ansible team. Uh, I was actually with the original Ansible company, and I've been along for the ride to Red Hat and then to, to IBM. And uh, I've been working on how Ansible can uh, integrate with and help automate things happening in the container native space. So one of the things being from, you know, working for Red Hat is that we looked into, uh, once we started this effort, how we could start to help automate what's happening in OKD and what's happening in OpenShift clusters. So what I was presenting here was like the 1.0 that we came up with uh, initially and how it came together. And I'm going to try to just speed through this. Um, uh, there's a lot of went on here, and we could go a whole lot deeper. Uh, I mean, uh, put together a demo if we have time for it. Um, if not, we can provide the code. So, uh, like I said, that's that's my background, where I'm coming from. There, I was a programmer at one time. I used to develop, and then became a PM, and then they took my keyboard away from me and said, "You are no longer allowed to code." Um, um, but I get to work on this type of stuff. Uh, Fabian, do you want to say a few things? Yeah, um, I'm Fabian von Feilich. I'm a uh, software engineer in the OpenShift org. I, I work on operator framework. Um, I've been involved in like the Ansible Kubernetes integration space um, since pretty much right after I got to Red Hat five years ago. Um, so I've just been working on building out like the Python uh, clients uh, and then integrating those Python clients with Ansible modules and things like that just to have like better sort of like full like application to infra uh, level integration uh, so that people who are using Ansible in their like traditional IT things can kind of more easily transition to the Kubernetes space without having to upend all of their tooling, logging, monitoring, um, et cetera. Um, and I'll cut it there so that we have time for the whole presentation. Right. Probably. Yeah, the, so the first thing I should mention, if it, it's not apparent by who's presenting to you, is that this was a joint effort between the Ansible team and the OpenShift team. Uh, Fabian was one of the engineers that um, came over and worked with us uh, in developing this, and we had some of our own people from the Ansible team working together on this. So uh, this is truly a joint effort that happened out there. Uh, so just diving in, uh, I'm going like, so to speed through this. So this thing that we're talking about, community.okd, is an Ansible content collection for automating and managing the unique capabilities of OKD and OpenShift systems. And the keyword there is unique, and I'm going to come back to that. Now, I know I'm not talking to an Ansible um, group here, so you might be wondering, well, what, what's a collection? Uh, you might be familiar with Ansible, but in, in uh, the last year or two, we've had this huge effort going on to separate the core engine that, that Ansible's known for, that command line tool, and the what we call the content, so that they're separate and that they can move independently. Uh, one of the problems we ran into with our batteries included approach was that you had to wait for the next release of Ansible to come out to get new features for um, a, a cloud service or, or some type of other application or API change, and, and, and it was just getting way too bogged down. So we came up with this thing called uh, Ansible Content Collections that we've been moving towards We're most of the way through, or it's just short for a collection. And it's a new format for organizing Ansible content so that it's independent of the engine and can be um, um, added and installed and updated independently of what's happening in that. So uh, what we're talking about here is one of those collections that is specific to working with OKD uh, and OpenShift here. So like I said, uh, just to review that then, and so, so uh, this is to focus on the unique capabilities of OKD and OpenShift systems. We also have another collection, which has been now renamed Kubernetes.core, 
And that provides the baseline Kubernetes and Helm 3 automation uh, capabilities out there. So if you're working uh, with OKD and, 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 and OpenShift, you're probably going to use both of these collections together in your, your playbooks. And the stuff that's baseline, you would um, work with the stuff that's in Kubernetes.core. And then when it comes to the things that are specific that OKD adds on top of that, then you would you would pull from uh, the, the community OKD collection. Uh, a couple other side notes, uh, if you go out and start researching this that you might become uh, confused or, or, or wonder about, is uh, uh, community OKD is the, down, is the upstream of, of a collection called Red Hat OpenShift, and that, that is the supported offering that we put together and put out there to customers. So it's one and the same, it's just one's, one's the, the downstream and one's the upstream of that content. Um, another quick side note is originally our Kubernetes content started off as a community effort and it was called community.kubernetes. We're going through the process of changing the name, uh, and migrating the repo, things like that. So they're, they're essentially the same, but the uh, community.kubernetes is going away for marketing and business reasons and is going to be called community or uh, kubernetes.core. All right. So that was just a little background so you know what you're looking at here. So let's talk about what is in this collection. Uh, so, so what we did when we, when we pulled together this effort uh, last summer to make something that was supportable, that, that we put full-time resources on, we worked together with, um, um, is we, we looked at the, what was in that community.kubernetes collection and said, all right, uh, we need to break this into two parts because what had happened is, is it was just done through community co contributions coming in, and it was it was um, mostly uh, baseline Kubernetes, but some uh, OpenShift specific features had rolled in, and then we were getting kind of uh, complaints from both sides, people that were trying to use OKD OpenShift and saying, uh, hey, this is missing, and then there were people on the baseline uh, uh, Kubernetes crowd coming to us and saying, hey, what is this stuff that's in here that it's operating different than it should? So we decided the best thing to do was then to, to split this stuff out into their own collections so that they could both move and focus on each other's communities um, better rather than trying to find this like um, middle ground. So uh, that was the, the one of the first big things that, that Fabian and other engineers uh, uh, took on. Uh, the other thing that Fabian was very, very helpful in was getting proper CI testing, uh, including Prow integration into this so that all of what we were doing got run against the latest uh, builds that were happening there. That was something that unfortunately wasn't happening in the previous uh, collection and work. Uh, so we migrated a whole lot of community, uh, community content over uh, uh, that was OpenShift specific, an inventory plugin, an OC connection plugin. There was a uh, uh, an OpenShift auth module that was called Capes Auth at the time. We've renamed, and then we created a um, a module specifically for working with declarative um, resources, but uh, gave it the added logic for working with things like. Um, I'm trying to remember some of them, deployment configs and projects and things that are specific to OpenShift that the Kubernetes core module would sort of trip on um, there. So uh, uh, one of the things that was uh, a little interesting that we went through is uh, Ansible's added namespaces and we decided to make use of that. Um, uh, and so we had the Kates module that, like I said, handled the baseline Kubernetes declarative APIs. So rather than create a, a totally different named one, we decided to use the Kate's name again because there are, you, you don't have to do it fully qualified like, like I've shown here. Um, it, it would make it a lot easier for people to move or, or port their playbooks between baseline Kubernetes and then moving to OpenShift um, in that regard because then they would just have to switch what namespace they were pulling that module from. So there's a little side note, more advanced thing. Uh, and then we created a few modules. So this is an area that we were, we went, did a quick survey and said, well, what are the most common things people are trying to automate with OpenShift right now to figure out what is in the 1.0? And the, and the two things that came up was here was the, the ability to ex, uh, expose a, a route, uh, which, which is sort of like the um, expose 
in Kubernetes, but the added stuff that you can do uh, in OpenShift. And then the other was was the uh, templates that, that came up, the ability to, to render and, and optionally apply those to what you were doing were also things that we were seeing a lot of people that were trying to use Ansible with OpenShift were, were trying to do and struggling and we wanted to make that easier. So we created those two modules there. Um, so I'm gonna stop there. Like I said, I sped through a lot of stuff. Um, do we wanna take the time for a demo? I think we we actually have the time. Well, there was one question in there. Okay. And, Sorry, and I, yeah, I can't I, see the chat, unfortunately, on the mic. That's okay, but I think you might have answered it. James, you were asking, will playbooks written for community OKD um, work without changes when used with Red Hat OpenShift? Uh, yes, as long as yes, there, there should be no no issue there. You just uh, have to be put a little bit of care into how you're managing your namespaces. If you do it fully qualified, like I showed back here, you would have to do a search and replace, but you don't have to do it this way. Um, and I would recommend not doing it this way if that's what you want, is the ability to go between the two easily. Um, there's, a, there's a way to create like a namespace search path at the beginning of your playbook. Uh, and then you don't have to do this stuff, the, the fully qualified stuff in your in your uh, in your plays in your roles, is there a reason why uh, the Red Hat OpenShift whatevers wouldn't also provide the community OKD name if they're going to effectively be identical? Um, that 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 was more of a marketing issue of our of customers getting confused to what is supported and what is not, and so we decided to do it through the naming to make it apparent. Okay. Um, yeah. There was also like. legal reasons that we couldn't use uh, OpenShift or Red Hat in a um, downstream. The fun oh, like I'm sorry, in an upstream. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's uh, JBoss all over again. Yay. <laughs> I, I know. Look, I cannot <laughs> tell you. Fabian is my witness. I almost yes. lost my mind trying to deal with this. I did not want this, but unfortunately, like I'm not a lawyer either. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I get it. I'm annoyed, but I get it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Oh, me too. With honestly. Yeah. Um. Right. Yeah. So there's a couple so. of things in the. Oops. Okay. Uh, James is Ansible is pushing very hard to get people to use the fully qualified name. This is going to make broken playbooks and roles when trying to switch to OKD and OCP. Um, yeah, that's more of an, we've done it for awareness and also clarity. When, when you're dropping in a single task to document something, you don't see all the other stuff you could have done at the command line or in the playbook declaration. And then it, the, you, people may get confused over time as you have modules with the same name appearing in different collections entirely, um, that it, it was, it's, just for clarity of that type of documentation. We're not recommending that, that everything you do should be done in, with fully qualified namespaces um, in your actual work. It's more of um, us getting this concept across and also in the clarity of when you're only taking a, a snippet and dropping it in, um, you could lose someone. Yeah. I don't know if that makes sense, James. Okay. Yes. Let's demo. Let me let me uh, let me drop yeah. control of the screen here, okay. so that uh, we have Fabian here. There you go. Fabian can grab it now. All right. Let's see. Uh... All right. Let me turn off my second monitor real quick so that it doesn't get confused by this. All right, uh, is this showing up properly for everybody? Uh, or no? Now we see your blue jean screen. Okay. Um, and can you see my, my terminal here? Yep. 
Now we yep, can. Now yes. we can. All right, cool. Um, so uh, I, I pasted a link to the uh, demo code uh, in the chat there. Um, basically, it's just going to run through this this Wait, demo playbook. You, yes. Can you make oh. that font bigger, please? Like very bigger, bigger, more. There we go. Can everybody read that? Okay. Yes. Perfect. Now I can read it. <laughs> okay. All right. Let's see. Uh, this is going to be a little rough. Okay. So. Um, Basically, first, I'll, I'll just run through uh, what the image stream um, uh, changes that we did. And uh, essentially, what we did was we made it so that uh, operator authors who were using deployment configs or deployments with image streams had this issue where, uh, because they specified an image, it would their operator and, and the uh, OpenShift controllers would constantly wrestle over the image field. So we just added some special logic to make it so that we would parse all those image triggers and things like that and, and not update if they're just going to be updating to what the controllers will set back. Um, and so this little uh, – uh, see if this even shows up properly. All right. So um, this is creating the project. Uh, we automatically translate the – projects to project requests when the user who's trying to create a project doesn't actually have the proper permissions to the API. Um, so that's one of those um, nice changes. Um, and it's kind of difficult to see <laughs> what's going on with uh, with the size, but this is just basically letting you know that the image stream has probably been created. This is like, you know, what it is, what the status of it is. Um, now we're creating uh, the deployment config. Uh, and this is mostly just show you the resources being used at these. Um, mostly it's just you just send it the raw, raw YAML, the same as the CLI utilities, uh, uh, basically. Um, deployment. Here's the image stream we're using. It's just giving us the, the Python Docker image. Um, and it's nice and speedy on this image pull. Sorry, my cluster died right before the presentation, so I had to spin up a, a, a new ephemeral cluster. So uh, there we go. Okay, so we can see this is the deployment config that was created. Um, it's the Python one. It's just spinning up an HTTP server so that we can make sure that our requests work. And then here um, we're going to issue this partial update. It's a patch. So it's targeting this Hello World DC deployment config we just made. Um, with just the small bit that we want to change. Um, Ansible will use that to create a patch request, um, telling it to replace the Python image, but we're already using the Python image, so nothing should change. Um, if, and we can see here that, in fact, the task was marked as OK, not changed, which means that uh, no actual change was made in the Kubernetes uh, API and, you know, the uh, nothing's going to be redeployed, and if you were in an operator context, uh, you wouldn't just be spinning now forever in an infinite loop, spinning up hundreds and hundreds of deployment configs over the course of minutes, which is uh, what users were hitting before. So here we're doing the same thing, creating a deployment. Um, now this deployment is using the image uh, trigger annotation in order to automatically replace that. Um, so just wanted to demonstrate that this is working uh, even in the sort of less uh, common uh, image trigger context. So we just got to wait for the image pull to happen. Um, and let me know if we're running low on time, and I can skip through uh, some of this as well. All right, there we go. So. Um, so we created the deployment reference in the stream, and then here we're going to do a similar thing, just issue a partial patch, only update the image, which should do absolutely nothing, and indeed it does. And we can also see that the actual image that is being used is the one set by the image stream rather than the one set uh, by the user, and we were able to detect and avoid an unnecessary update that there. Um, Um, so that was the image streams. Um, so now we're going to show the little utilities we made for 
doing routes. Um, first, we're just going to spin up a, a basic deployment that spins up the Hello OpenShift container. Um, we'll create a service. You can see it's basically just an inline definition. Uh, you can do either inline or uh, files on disk. Um, it'll work fine either way. Um, and then here, rather than having to craft the route definition by hand, uh, we have this OpenShift route uh, module, which uh, is the same basic uh, functionality as uh, the route-specific features in OpenShift uh, and OC Expose, as well as OC Create Route, um, but re-implemented with Python. Um, so it inter integrates with the uh, Ansible um, code better. So we can see, like with this, we just specified the service we wanted to expose with the namespace we wanted to expose it in, and it was it created this route spec based on that. It parsed the target ports from the service, you know, all the things that uh, users would expect. Um, and we can see, hit that URL, that the content we get back is the Hello OpenShift from that Hello OpenShift container. Um, clean up that route. Um, and then I'm, I'm going to skip through most of these. I, I mostly just added them in here for, um, you know, if anyone's interested and wanted to go through to see all the different things they can expose. Um, but you can create routes with custom names. You can create uh, routes with different termination policies uh, that allow insecure or don't allow insecure or, you know, have redirection. Basically, everything that you could do with, with OpenShift Create Route or OpenShift uh, Expose. Um, so let's just skip past all these. All right. Um, so uh, auth. Um, users, for some reason, always want to use the username and password to log in. Um, the password, obviously, ideally provided by a secret and not in line, as in this playbook. Um, so in order to enable that, uh, we added this OpenShift auth module, which can handle all of the um, OAuth server interactions that uh, you know OC login does. Um, so here, we're just going to create uh, an HD password uh, secret and identity provider, uh, a new user that uses it, give that user uh, the cluster reader access, and then use this OKD uh, OpenShift auth module to manually log in to the cluster using just the username and password that uh, we configured there. Do this real quick. That created a secret. This created the identity provider. And now we create the user create the cluster role binding. Um, this task is using uh, one of the modules from the uh, community of Kubernetes, soon to be Kubernetes.core um, collection in order just to get uh, information about the cluster, what APIs it supports, what, uh, you know, what host and connection cert file, like all, all the different information about uh, what the cluster, what cluster we're connected to and how we're connecting to it. Um, so. Now we'll issue this login command, which I may have just accidentally skipped, and I did. Yeah. Um, sorry about that. Going to restart real quick. Yeah, you're okay. All right. I clearly made some kind of typo. Oh, I think it's when you run it in step mode, it's it's confused here. Um, my my apologies for that. It wouldn't be a demo if it live if it didn't have something, Fabian. Yep. Uh, I knew it was bad when I saw the cluster go down, and I was like, okay, everything I set up to make sure that this will work <laughs> no longer exists. So, okay, there we go. So now that I actually ran all the proper tasks and all the variables were defined, um, here we can see it logged in. Uh, it returned an API key. Uh, and host for an ephemeral cluster. Um, and now 
as that user, we're going to just use this basic Kate's info module to uh, list all the pods in the testing namespace, which is the namespace that we were um, running those initial imagery tests in. So we can see that that user, hopefully, yes, that user does have the permissions. Um, so we, we logged in as that user, and the user's permissions were properly configured um, to list all those pods that we defined in that, in that previous playbook. Um, and then just the last one here. Um, so this is just basically the OpenShift process, uh, OC process uh, subcommand, but, you know, accessible via a, uh, a module. So you can either, you can target local templates, you can target templates in the cluster, you can either render them and get the list of rendered resources um, back, which you can then store and then create by hand uh, in the cluster, or uh, you can just say, you know, uh, rent, like render and then create all the resources in, in a single task. So we process this template from the cluster, we're rendering it locally. So this is the basic, uh, like default included uh, Nginx example template. Um, so, you know, it's just a service, a pod. Um, and now we can iterate over them, create those resources. Ignore those warnings. Um, yeah, basically pretty straightforward. Um, and then here, same basic thing, but we're just letting the module handle creation as well. And it's just gonna basically run to the same logic. And since it's the same template with the same parameters, it actually shouldn't really result in, in any actual work being done. Yeah, so. Um, all right, and then this is the last little bit of the demo. Um, so this is demoing the inventory and connection plugins. Um, and what this basically allows you to do is uh, if you just configure that you want to use the OKD.OpenShift uh, uh, inventory plugin, um, it can basically just, when Ansible starting up, it will query the cluster. Um, you can trim it, you can have multiple clusters in, in your inventory, you can have multiple namespaces or all namespaces, but basically it will go out to all the different pods and add them to the Ansible inventory as targetable hosts. Um, so here you can see, like, we want to target all the pods in namespace testing, so these are the hosts that we specify. This is a group that was automatically constructed by the OpenShift inventory plugin. Um, and uh, basically we're just going to do little okay and it immediately failed that's cool um, if it failed it's probably it looks like it was a build image so it failed because it was not a, a, an image that had Python in it I think but we can see here that we had our hello world deployment image and our hello world DC uh, container and our hello world DC container, um, the ones that we defined in that initial image stream um, example that are in the testing namespace. Um, like they, they both were found, discovered, and we were able to reach out and get information from them. Um, uh, I didn't point it out, but if you go to our deployment config, it has this environment variable uh, test. Um, the deployment has the same variable test. And so we're just gonna verify here um, that we can output the message of that NVAR because uh, this code is running, this is so difficult to see, because this code is running on that actual container running in the cluster automatically gathered by uh, the playbook. So we can see there on both of those two hosts that it found that were successful, um, the test NVAR was defined and its value is what we set it to. And then this is just showing that you can also then use the, the copy and flirt modules to copy content back and forth between the cluster uh, and the host and retrieve file content and assert that that content is the same, um, except I skipped one of those tasks. But uh, yeah, that's basically it. That, that's the demo I had prepared. Um, apologies for the, uh, the choppiness of it at times, um, but Basically, we're just trying to make it so that the experience of uh, using um, Ansible to automate your workflow is 
got like all the same functionality as as using Bash, but with all the niceness of using Ansible, like idempotence. Um, you saw there my demo crashed a couple times. I was able to run through it without everything being changed and constantly redeploying or anything. So, um, yeah. So, yeah, that's a good question to ask, Timothy. Yes. Yeah. So, um, thanks, thanks, Bobby. Uh, it was that was great. I hope it got across like all the different things that you can do to to automate and cut down on all the command line stuff you would have to do and manual work and repetitive work every time you would deploy a cluster or do anything. The the, the big question that we have for, for, for you is besides using it, trying out, seeing how we did in our, our 1.0 is, uh, you know, what could we do next? What do you want to see in this next? There's, there's a lot of areas that we didn't touch on. And the question we kept asking ourselves was, well, would that be useful? Well, which one of these is a priority? Which one is not. Uh, that's the type of feedback that we're looking for. Uh, we, we got a good core set of feedback, mostly from, from Red Hat consultants and a couple other people we knew in the community that were doing work with Ansible and OpenShift, and they gave us that initial batch of use cases, and we've essentially covered them all right now. So we're wondering, where do we go next? So that's the feedback we'd love to hear. Um, for those of you who are interested, like I will give this deck to uh, Diane to to send around, uh, but uh, these are some of the repos of, of the content you were looking at, starting with, with Fabian's um, the demo code that he was just running through, and, and the repos where we're developing the collections we've been talking about. And then there's a bunch of uh, blog posts if you want to go deeper and, and read about this stuff uh, in, in, in more detail, maybe more elegantly than I've been speaking uh, about it. So uh, that is all that we had. Well, that sounds good. It, um, I think we, we could use some feedback from the community on um, maybe some uh, uh, maybe more uh, useful examples. The example was good, Fabian, not that it was bad, but just um, how, how people um, would use this in, in production. And so Joseph and other folks who are doing that, um, your feedback will be most welcome. So, so what is... Uh... Go ahead. One thing I'd love to see, and maybe it's already part of, of the playbooks, um, is kind of um, standard operating procedures for uh, admin tasks, like uh, key rotation. Um, I'm not sure we probably don't have that yet, but something like uh, snapshotting and backing uh, the backup of cluster states. Um, so I, I'm not sure, is, do, do we have a playbook for key rotation, for example? Um, no, so the content there was mostly focused on just kind of like providing those basic building blocks, um, kind of the foundational work in order to uh, allow us to build more things on top of that. But collections do allow you to currently distribute roles, um, and I believe in the future it's planned to allow you to distribute playbooks as well. Um, and so the hope is that as we sort of build this out, um, get more community involvement, um, get some uh, you know, better subject matter experts. I deal a lot, you know, working with operators with the Kubernetes API and low-level components and things like that. I have less experience with sort of higher-level cluster administration. Um, and so uh, that's definitely, like, we we would love to have playbooks and roles in or that would enable users yeah. to, like, very easily automate um, those tasks. But, um, you know, that's sort of, like, now is the point where we go out to the community and, and like, you know, look for people who who know about that, don't necessarily need to do you know, all of it, but if they have, you know, requests for features like that, um, documentation, maybe some, like, getting started places, like, that, those would all be very useful things for us to see pop up in that repo um, in order to help us prioritize and also in order to help us understand what exactly those cluster administration tasks are and how we can help automate them. Question. Oh. Wait. So... I, I just hey. hopped on maybe halfway through the thing. Sorry. <laughs> well, okay. Well, I was actually yeah. going to ask something on your behalf, Sri. I guess now that you're okay. here, you can ask. Yeah, me. yeah. Um, there, there. Are, speaking specifically to like cluster administration, one of the things that has uh, you know been a pain point in deploying new and newer new clusters, fresh clusters, is um, like the simple things like approving certificates and stuff like that. I didn't see anything specifically in your demo about like those sorts of like one-off kind of deals it was more about like making yamls and pushing yamls into places 
And I know you can sort of hack the existing Kubernetes plugin. You can do some stuff and like write some Ansible magic that would be really brittle. But we're supporting workflows like that, like maybe specifically certs, because that is such a pain point, would be really cool to see. Yeah, and yeah, I'd like I, mean, to I would love it. That, that, like that's to, the exact. Sorry, go ahead. Yeah. And I'd like to tack on to Sri's ask. Um, specifically, one of the major pain points I have right now is orchestrating UPI OKD slash OpenShift deployments because um, if you read the guides or the documentation on this, it's fairly involved, it is somewhat difficult to coordinate, and this is one of those things where um, Ansible orchestration can make this a very easy path to, to get things set up correctly uh, when you can't use the IPI style orchestration. Like, for example, at work, we have an OpenStack that's sufficiently old that the IPI cannot orchestrate it. And so we have to do UPI-based deployments. And it would be very nice if UPI wasn't a pain to do. Um, and a lot of this comes from, we previously orchestrated using Ansible for OpenShift 3X. And there is basically no automation path for OpenShift 4X for a UPI-based deployment. And that's sort of, like that's, I think if you're if you're considering admin tasks, that's probably what I would consider the number one pain point in terms of admin tasks that people would frequently want to reach for Ansible for. Yeah, that's that's good feed. That's good feedback. Um, have you met Roger Lopez at all? He, no. He's uh, he I believe. I believe he was working on UPI. Um, he, he wrote some Ansible playbooks to do, to help with some UPI. Um, but I also to these points, one of the things that we have heard on a very broad level uh, that, that where people are interested in applying Ansible is what we're calling last mile configuration. It's like the installer gets you so far, but then it gets you to a point where you need to do additional things to make that cluster useful. And those things are, yep probably very specific to what you're trying to do with that cluster, that it's hard for a, an installer to capture it all. And then it's doing all those repetitive tasks. And that, yeah. that was something that we've heard. It, it was stuff with etcd, it was stuff with nginx, stuff with Prometheus. Even just getting cluster. storage into the cluster is oh, God, a, a huge pain on UPI. Like I, you're, what you're describing is exactly my experience. I have, I have basically a bash script and the first half of the bash script is use the installer to get the cluster going. And the second half is slam YAML file after YAML file into it in order to get it to a point where I can actually use the thing. In the right order with sufficient amount of retries with some blind hope and prayer that it will actually do the right thing. Like yep. there's, it's, there's a bunch it's usually of... a three or four hour job. Yeah. It shouldn't be, but it is. So I think- So what I'd just like to, I think, point out here is that this Ansible project is probably not meant for installing the cluster. At least that's not the focus, um, or it shouldn't be. Because I, I think there was a a decision, um, an informed decision made not to repeat um, the installer we, we had in, in Origin 3.x. So um, yeah, I'm, I'm not sure how, how much you want to focus no, on. No, no, no. Standing I mean, up day, day so. zero. Day it's not that. It in, It'd it's be not nice if hard. things like that could be more, like I'm not asking for another OpenShift Ansible like we had for 3X, right? That was that was its own special variant of pain. But um, I, think, I think for this kind of stuff, it would be nice if the, and I guess this is one of those things where we will just have to sort of play with it as a, as a community and figure it out. But there's a lot of these sort of like the cert approval, things like that, and, uh, I would think making it a little bit more templated in terms of like deployment configs would also help a whole bunch just for like making it quicker for people to spin up their own Ansible playbooks. Because right now it is highly, highly manual to write all of the YAMLs out in Ansible. Good and good I think that. you guys are already getting there, but yeah. Yeah, like it, it's it's so manual to the point that it is preferable to just do a bash script and hope and pray which is, I think, not what anybody actually wanted. 
hard to agree. The problem, the problem with the search approval in particular is that you actually have to look into them because there is no the only way to find out that a malicious node didn't join your cluster is to actually looking into those certificates. So making an automated approval is very complex unless you're in IPI world where you can confirm that the cert is valid. You can confirm the cert being valid without IPI just fine if you know what the master cert is and that's part of your playbook or whatever. Like we have a copy of the of the parent cert inside the bash script and it just checks that to see if that's what it was derived from. And that's again, that's stupid and manual and horrible, but it is still it it is not throwing your hands up in the air and saying UPI is impossible to automate is basically the wrong approach for making this successful because I can promise you almost 100% of all um, small use workloads are going to be UPI because none of the IPIs work. Just zero of them work. And so you can't say UPI is effectively unautomatable. Like you have to start looking at, if you've got all the IPI stuff done, what are the bits and pieces of UPI that you can bite off and turn into something automatable? Because Right now, it's such a terrible place to be that it is just easier to go with the own special place of pain that is the OpenShift Ansible playbook for 3x, because that is better than the current situation for UPI on 4x. Yeah, let, let me jump in here again. I think um, that, again, is a huge opportunity for the community, for you, Neil, to step up and uh, contribute some playbooks um, there. I think, yeah, with UPI, um, obviously, we prefer everybody to use IPI. It's much easier. Uh, we have a much clearer picture of the, the cluster we're, we're getting in the end. Uh, that is kind of what we're aiming for, right? So if you, use, if you have to use UPI, if that's your only uh, option, then so be it. But we can't really account for all the different, there's just vastly different setups there. And so if, if you have one that you think is, has a broad enough, um, you know, it is applicable, it is applicable in, a, in, a, in a big number of cases. Um, yeah, I mean, um, I think Christian, submitting the, a, a... Yeah, so guys, we're, we're also at... For that would be great. We're, we're at the end of the hour, which is what happens to us every week. Um, <laughs> and um, so, yeah, Neil, if, if there's a, a broad-based one that we could do to solve a group of them, or at least get a, a good recipe done, um, that would be a great contribution to get started. And maybe working with the Ansible collections folks to get it tested and will be a good good thing to do. So, yeah, sure. Yeah, I, I know it's work, and and it's it's not that it's work. I don't care about that part. Uh, the, my fundamental problem is that the way that the OpenShift installer has been has been designed is it's, it's either I know all the things or I know none of the things. That's not an acceptable path for making it a, a true successor. You've got to be able to make the installation process more composable. I would love it if the IPI steps that are part of OpenShift installer were just pieces I could invoke separately. And then I could say, well, this piece doesn't apply in my stuff and I could just call the rest of it, do second stage through IPI and first stage through myself. Like, that is not even possible. There's no pluggable backends. Like this is, there is no avenue to make this better as far as I can tell other than writing all the crap from scratch over and over and over again. And that's frankly not good. And that's my problem. With Obviously that. we do test UPI in an automated PI setup um, and if that were, you know, more agnostic to to the underlying platform, I guess um, you, you could use that everywhere. But that is ju that just works on RCI because it's set up for that. And with UPI, you just have to each time adapt it to the environment you're you're setting it up in. So it's it is difficult to account for all of that. And if you want to account for all of these, um, you know, options, um, then you end up with something like the Ansible installer in OKD three. So you know, there is some trade-off to be made here, and I think um, we're definitely 
you know, if, if you're able to use IPI, it's much easier that way, and you should do that. Obviously, that, that's not going to help anybody who, who isn't able, but still, um, I think I, I want to just uh, highlight that the IPI install workflow works really, really well and much better than um, in OpenShift 3.0. And there's a little conversation on the side that I want to encourage Sandro to continue to have um, offline, maybe on the, the Google mailing list that we have um, to, to continue this conversation because we are out of time today. Um, it's a good and it's a healthy conversation to have, Neil, so um, we'll keep poking it and making the install better and see what we Could can I, do. Go ahead. Could I add a quick comment here? Yep. Um, just because the whole idea of like uh, pluggable installers and stuff is coming up and I had a really relevant uh, kind of architecture call earlier today and we were talking about um, how we're going to bring more providers in for OpenShift. Like this is in the context of, you know, like an Alibaba cloud provider and, uh, you know, Equinix Metal and whatnot. These, these are some of the work that's going on now. And it sounds like there is some traction taking place, at least from the kind of Hive and installer teams, about this notion of how do we create materials that would allow some of these cloud providers to more easily integrate with our installation uh, sources? You know, like, I don't want to say an interface or an API, but something they could write to to make it easier for providers to plug into that. And it's not the exact same thing that, like, Neil and Shri are talking about, but it's kind of in the same area, I think. You know, yeah, it's, it's well, going that direction, so. I mean, if um, that existed, if that existed, there is a much easier path for even me to orchestrate within our internal infrastructure because things are kind of special because of reasons. But but it's still a cloud infrastructure platform. It's still OpenStack. Right, like, right. I mean, so, it, so it's a software-defined fabric. So I should be able to do that, but there's just no avenue to plug those things in. Right. So I mean, the long and the short is it doesn't exist. It's very much a, a an idea right now, but people are thinking about this idea and we're especially thinking about it in terms of how do we open up the installer so that we could allow more platforms to write to the installer without needing to go through this you know huge process of creating a machine API implementation and then reviewing that and then getting it into the installer and then reviewing, you know, there's a lot of chicken and the egg problems that go on here. So mm -hmm. I've just given you a little window into the sausage factory here of kind of sure. things that I've been hearing about. So. Yeah. Well, I'm glad to see that something is actually progressing on that front, even if it is just conceptualization at this point, because that's better than just saying it's not going to ever be fixed. Yeah, and people are thinking about it, and it's yeah. a great, I mean, what you've talked about here is kind of interesting, and I'll, I'll certainly yell at people on the other side about it. Well, not yell, but yeah. Yes. We'll, we'll sure. use top capital letters in, in text messaging back and forth in Google Chat. So, Excellent. Um, not quite yelling, but it hmm. is, Neil, it, it, it is not to say that your concerns aren't heard or anything. It's just um, we, you know, trying to figure out how we can move from the community point of view as well to get some content or some, uh, some basic stuff started, um, even if it's a stub, to move this forward. And if you and Sri um, have that bandwidth to even get there, um, that would be helpful. So, and and yes, your passion is totally, um, totally taken. Well, I, yeah, both of us, I think, are wanting to um, clean up the the UPI stuff that we did and make that kind of publicly available on the. OpenShift org somewhere as a cookbook or whatever, but like the it highlight. I just wanted to highlight the general problem that we have, where these kinds of things are just difficult to create and then maintain because the underlying architecture of OpenShift installer is so hostile to this kind of stuff, and that's that's something that really needs to be rethought. Yeah. Well, um, we'll get there. That's, we'll a, get rethink there. that's yeah. a rethinking for a the next meeting. I'm going to reiterate, um, and I'll put a note out on the Google um, group about if people want to come and talk about docs next Tuesday at this same time. I think what I want to use is the other week to do docs work um, and have conversation about how to move that forward. So I will um, do that. And um, yes, and we do want to invite Neil to as many team meetings. Um, to keep spurring people on, that would be great. Um, so anyways, it's after the hour, about almost 10 minutes. Thank you for um, 
taking the time and um, we will pull in Sri too, of course. Um, so anyways, thanks guys. We'll talk to you all, some of you next week. Um, I'll post this, um, this session up, Timothy and Fabian, thank you for coming um, on our YouTube channel. And um, if you want to redo it, Fabian and Timothy, as a like a little short briefing, um, uh, or I can just edit out your stuff into a short little video clip. I mean, Fabian, if you want to redo maybe your demo, I'll happy to re-record it or have you re-record it and um, share that out with the universe as well. So um, thanks for all of your work, and um, hopefully we'll get you some there. And OpenShift Commons content, I always want OpenShift Commons com content, but I want—I think I want this sooner than I can schedule a, an AMA briefing on it, because I think I'm booked out until the end of March now. So, um, yeah. So, Fabian, if ping me on, in Google Chat if you want to re-record or if you're okay with me using it as is, I'll, I'll just snip it out. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. Take care, guys. I'm hanging up now. Everybody, deep breath. Have a wonderful week, and. Um, We'll talk to you all soon. Take care. All right. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Take care. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Later, y'all. Bye, everyone.